to the Rick Fuller podcast presented by Rick Fuller, team leader of the number one real estate team in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sac County for most recent sales according to Zillow. Rick has offices in the Bay Area and Sac County and is a national real estate coach and community leader. I'm Christina Morales. I'm a writer and I'm a marketer and I'm an avid learner of all things real estate. And Rick is my mentor in this. Today's topic is, should a real estate agent become a real estate investor? And our special guest is Shelby Seeley. She's the lead buyers coach on Rick's team. So welcome, Shelby. Thank you. So Rick, can you tell us a little bit about the four R's that you've discussed? We're on a theme of how real estate agents should um, put their money, invest their money in four different buckets. Can you tell us a little bit about that and lead us into our topic? Yeah, so great question, Christina. Welcome, Shelby. We're so glad to have you on the call today. And I'm so excited because it's going to be so valuable to so many real estate agents out there uh, because Shelby is not only knows what to do, but she's actually doing it. And that's a game changer in teaching others to do the same. So the four R's, here's the idea. Um, it is not enough just to sell real estate. I remember somebody once told me, you're only as good as your last real estate sale. Well, that didn't make any sense at the time, uh, but now I understand what he was referring to. What he was saying by, you're only as good as your last real estate sale, is if you don't build momentum, then when you sell a house or receive a real estate commission, you'll exhaust that commission and there'll be nothing left. And so what we told our real estate agents is that your real estate commission is much like that of a faucet. And as you start growing your business and start maturing your business and advancing your business, you can turn up that income faucet uh, to the point where it's no longer a drip, but there is a solid flow of real estate cash flow that's coming your way, real estate income. And what you do with that faucet um, matters significantly. And in my experience, it is very unfortunate in the industry that we're in and that I love most real estate agents let that income go right down the drain. And they invested in bigger cars, greater vacations. Uh, they invested in um, advertising that they don't even know that's working. Um, and it just goes down the drain. There's nothing to show for it. So we teach that as, that as you begin to grow that faucet, turn that faucet on, you begin to fill buckets. So we talk about four of those buckets. One, you fill the retirement bucket. Have something later on in life to show for all your hard work. Number two, you fill the residual bucket. Uh, we built a real estate team that creates residual income for our agents. And so you have income as a result of helping others achieve their goals and not necessarily going out showing property, listing homes, and writing offers as most agents do. Number three, build reserves. Reserves being have some money set aside in a savings account. We recommend three to six months. The COVID-19 coronavirus has, a pandemic has taught us the value of having a little bit of money set aside, right? Not, not have all your money in one basket, have a little bit of money set aside. And the fourth R, which is what we're gonna talk about today, real estate agents ought to own real estate. It is a, a tragedy that real estate agents help others accomplish their goal in real estate investment, help others plant seeds in their field, and they look back over their career, and there are orchards and orchards and orchards uh, of filled with fruit and results, and they look at their own field, and it's barren, nothing but wheat. They didn't plant any seeds for themselves. And the irony is that the best deals went right through their hands. The best deals came across their desk. Their office is most privy to real estate. They got the forms, the advertising, the contracts, the experience, the know-how, and they do it for everybody else except for themselves and their own family. And so to, to have a, a solid financial plan as a real estate agent, real estate is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So Shelby, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role on Rick's team and how you took his advice and you went from an agent, well, and you're an agent right now and you're active, but you're also an investor. You're doing both time and simultaneously. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm currently the lead buyer coach within uh, our team. 
and I coach uh, around 25 buyer agents, uh, the best team there is or the best group there is. Mm -hmm. um, and so really what prompted us is I've actually, we were actually uh, real estate investors before ever becoming real, before I ever became a real estate agent. Okay. Um, and so that was probably, I would say maybe 14 or 15 years ago that we owned our first investment property. Um, and from that, <clears throat> from owning that property and really buying it from a place of an auction, we purchased it. We did purchase it with uh, Rick. We partnered together and uh, we ended up buying it at auction and flipping that property. And from um, owning some of those investment properties, I really enjoyed the process and then decided to pursue real estate as a career. And so continued uh, purchasing investment properties as well as owning some today. Oh, that's great. Yes. Um, that's cool. So Rick, you mentioned that real estate agents don't invest in their own project. So why don't they? And what should they be doing to start? Just like Shelby said, how she got into it, what should they do to start their uh, path? Well, I, you know, Shelby and her husband, Joe, and my wife, Jennifer, the four of us have invested in properties, in all variety of properties, buy and hold properties, and buy and flip properties, and uh, we bought auction properties, which is the result of a foreclosure that they foreclosed, and um, we've, we've been doing this for a very long time, and so one of the amazing things about uh, buying investment property and is that it creates a cash flow that you don't often receive with other types of investments. And most real estate agents could benefit from having a consistent cash flow income. Now, it, it, at first, that cash flow income might go towards paying down their mortgage. And eventually, as that mortgage is paid off, there's no longer a need to pay the mortgage company. And that creates income for the investor. Uh, you know, Shelby talked about the auction property that we had bought. And at that time, um, her husband Joe and I and, and Jennifer, we worked together. And Joe would actually go out and look for properties for us. And I kind of drew up a, a model of what I thought was a good investment home. Because a lot of people purchase properties and they're good as a primary residence. Uh, they're great for raising your kids, but they're not a great investment property. So we actually created a model that define what an exceptional investment property was. <laughs> this particular story, uh, we had identified about 12 homes and we had gone to a, an auction. If my memory serves correctly, I think it was in Sacramento and it was in a huge ballroom uh, when they were doing these auctions. They give you a paddle and you raise the paddle. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, about a dozen properties that we were planning on bidding. Uh, bidding on and we knew our amounts and we knew what it would cost to buy the property. We knew what it would cost to hold the property. We knew what it cost to sell the property. And we showed up at the auction. I remember Joe and I were in a, a, my pickup truck and we were talking about and we took the 12 or so and we limited those to about eight properties. They were kind of our top eight. And I actually took the sheets of the other four and I put them in the side console of my pickup truck. We went in uh, Joe and I sat there and I bid on every one of those properties and all eight of them, we were almost immediately overbid. And they, the auctioneer kept going and I'm not a very emotional kind of guy. So I'm kind of the right guy to hold the paddle because it just doesn't get me emotionally going. Like most people, they just keep raising the paddle because they want to win. And I'm kind of like, hey, here's the number. And when I'm done, I'm done. But the Joe story it like ping pong. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's exactly right. And the story continues that all the properties that we had brought in, the auctioneer um, exceeded the amount that we were willing to bid on the home. We got to the last property that they were auctioning off that day, and they started the bid on this property, and it was very strange, but nobody was bidding on this home. And this was actually the property that I had folded and put in the, in the side console of my truck. So we had left that, so we had no idea. I remember looking at Joe to say, do you remember what we had wrote on this particular property? And he said, man, I, I remember this home, I remember. And the auctioneer started bidding on the property and they categorized the property as a three bedroom home in a very desirable area. Hmm. And uh, Joe had walked through the property and said, no, no, that's definitely a four bedroom. And I knew the swing in that community, just knowing the market, 
at the swing on a four bedroom versus a three bedroom home, it wasn't hundreds, it was tens of thousands of dollars different. And I looked at Joe and I said, how confident are you in that? And he says, I'm absolutely confident it's a four bedroom home. I raised my paddle and we bought the property. Now, I'd like to say we drove the speed limit from Sacramento to that property, but we did not. But Just to check, right, Rick? You wanted to check to make sure it was actually four bedrooms? And we drove as fast as we could to that property. When we got to the property that we had bought with no contingencies or anything, when we got to that particular property and we walked through it, and sure enough, it was indeed four bedrooms. And the market for that particular home in that auction uh, was significantly better for a four bedroom home. Uh, Joe was right. <laughs> we ended up buying the property. That particular home, uh, we cleaned the carpet. I can remember there was some um, uh, dirt in the sink. I wiped down the sink. I hired a landscaper. We, we got the keys on Friday and I dropped the sign in on Monday. And, uh, wow. Shortly then after. We had received an offer and buyers were willing to pay more for the home as a result of that fourth bedroom, yeah. which looking back on it, it's why the investors were not bidding on that home at auction because they thought it was just a three bedroom home. And it really, the public records had it as, as a four bedroom property and we closed escrow, put the home back on the market, cleaned it up as really very, very minimal. To this day, I think that's probably Shelby of all the flips that I've done, the least amount I ever put into it. I think we cleaned it, we we let we we mowed the lawn. I don't even think we landscaped it, and we put, dropped our sign in. And very quickly after, we had a buyer and closed escrow and did really well on that investment property. It pays to do your homework. I think it pays to do your homework. And Joe did a great job of walking through the property and knowing the characteristics. Um, and. And the funny part was that we had left the, the actual printout of that home that we had prepared for, just trying to prioritize which one we were going to bid on. We left it in the cars. We didn't have it readily available. Um, and, but Joe knew that, that home, and I knew the market. And I knew that the, 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 the benefit of having that home, that neighborhood, that community with an additional bedroom was significant in the market. And I think, you know, I tell you that story in no way to brag. I, I just tell you the story because what you hear on late night TV commercials, what you hear on late night infomercials are very different than what real estate investors are really actually doing. Mm -hmm. Shelby, you and I have been working together collectively maybe eight, nine years now, and even before that, investing in real estate. And how many people have we experienced that came that come came in with some form of book, video, download, class, mentor. And how many times have you experienced that? Like I'm ready to invest in real estate and, and how many times does that come, happen where they come in with that kind of investor mentor, if you will? Yeah, I mean, hundreds, hundreds yeah. within the, the years that we've worked together, um, yeah. yeah. And, and unfortunately, we kind of have to sit down with them and tell them the truth of yes. how you really do purchase real estate and investment properties. And we're happy to do that. We're happy to sit down and educate uh, people on how to purchase investment properties. What's the greatest misperception then when they walk in? To the point where Shelby and I, as we would meet with them, in, and we try to do it as tactfully as we can, is I would always ask them, who are you listening to? And they would always say, no, no, this is just what I wanted to ask. Well, who's your mentor? Yes. And then I would finally hear names like Carlton Chi or, or you know, some other company that they were following. And, and that helped me to see where they were at. Because that wasn't their fault. They learned, they, they were excited, they had the right motivation. They just didn't have the practical way that real estate is actually invested. Now, Shelby, you and I, We've served a thousand, we've helped a thousand people now invest in real estate, according to Zillow. And we've learned what people are actually doing in contrast to the myth that's sold to them at late night TV commercials. Um, yeah. And it's totally different. And what we see that the best, the, the best investors that we work with, they actually, there's three different kinds of real estate uh, pursuers, if you will, pursuers of real estate. 
Uh, the first one I like to say, we, we can spot them immediately, they're real estate spec, uh, speculators. So they come in, Christina, and they're like, if I buy this home and the market's going up 10%, I'm a real estate speculator, then of course the home is gonna be worth 10% more the following year. But mm -hmm. if you were in business in 2006, you realize mm -hmm. that does not always happen. And right. that is truly based on real estate speculation. And I would even argue they're not an investor yet. Mm -hmm. They are simply a spec speculator. They're speculating on this is only gonna go up in value. Another type of speculator might be this huge firm is moving in, this huge employer is moving in, the BART station is coming and I just know what's going to happen with, the, and that's a speculator. There's a lot of things that are dependent on that happening that are out of your control as a pursuer of real estate and real estate speculators often come back with egg on their face and they end up touching the stove and getting burnt uh, with their real estate experience. Second kind of um, pursuer of real estate that we see are real estate investors. Now, I love these people. We were just joking before we got on. I'm the analytical guy. I'm the numbers guy. One of my mentors taught me if you do the numbers, the numbers will tell you what to do. So I do the numbers and they're real estate investors. And I love these people because we can speak intelligently about the investment available for real estate and, and they, what they purchase it at and what kind of rental income that they can generate. And we can do the math and we can look at that and make sure it lines up. Uh, can we get higher rents with a lower purchase price? What, what happens when we go too high? And they begin to understand that there's that model that exists for owning real estate as a real estate investor, because they're concerned about cash flow. Many of uh, the people that listen to us on these calls, they follow somebody by the name of Robert Kiyosaki, who was in a cash flow investment. He was never a speculator. He talked a lot about cash flow and buying properties, right? And the third person I see, and I really enjoy working with these, they're not speculators. They're not necessarily real estate investors looking purely at the numbers, but they're collectors of real estate. You know, when I was a kid, we used to collect baseball cards or you know, Hot Wheels, and you'd have this whole collection, right? It'd be different kinds and different sizes. And the, the real estate investors, when they grow up, they become collectors of real estate. And they might own some single family, they might own some commercial, they might own in-state, out-of-state, they might own vacation rental. Uh, they might own long-term, short-term flips, holds. Like there, there's a whole variety. There's a there's a plethora of real estate that they own, almost like they're collectors. Like they, in some sense, they're just older. <laughs> instead of trading in for Hot Wheels and for baseball cards, it's their collection of real estate. Right. There's right. such a diversity in their real estate portfolio. And. One of the, that's exactly right, Shelby. What I love about working with those individuals um, is that if you were to meet with a financial advisor, the word diversification has got to come out, right, in a conversation. Like, don't keep up. And, well, you're all in real estate. But if you can diversify geographically by different classes of property, commercial, residential, vacation, rent, by various lengths of property, short-term, long-term property, right? that you can create diversification just within real estate. And it doesn't have to be that you've got to go outside of real estate to diversify your simple real estate portfolio. And Shelby said, you, you got things kind of mixed around a little bit. And that's healthy. Because when one market is going up, the other market may be going down and one market may even be going sideways. And as we look at these things, we can then be in a better balanced market. You know, when residential values were going up, commercial was really stalling. And when commercial properties were going up, residential was stalling. And so uh, properties in certain areas might be impacted because of a factory that closed or a manufacturer or, or, or maybe just some political unrest in that community. And we look at having it spread out geographically and we can create diversification by owning real estate. And the real estate agent that's investing in real estate, speculator, investor, or collector, the real estate agent that's investing in real estate, 
they have far more confidence and credibility in the market. And what I love about that, and Shelby and I teach that, that, that if you're going to be successful in real, selling real estate in this generation, it's no longer, let me tell you what you ought to do. Let me, um, sh let me share with you what you ought to do. It's more about, let me just give you a little window into what I'm doing as a real estate there's credibility, there's authenticity, there's genuineness there. Instead of, let me tell you what I read in the book last night or what my mentor says. It's like what you're actually doing to invest in real estate. And we are encouragers of our clients. What we found, our team members, Shelby said, she's got about 20, 25 buyer specialists. When they invest in real estate, there's a catalyst in their business because they have a level of confidence in the product and service that they provide compared to an agent that um, doesn't invest in real estate at all and is just simply a, for trying to sell it, they become let, an opening the door and opening the window into what they're actually doing. I feel like there's a level of trust and confidence that's layered on when I'm speaking to an investor and I get to, and I share with them, this is how I uh, invest in properties. And these are my current investment properties. And all of a sudden it's like their guard comes down yeah. and they are like, Oh, okay. I trust you now. Tell me, how do you do it? And uh, instantly we have that connection and then they trust whatever I'm advising. And it really, really helps. It builds that credibility. Mm -hmm. Well, it sure does. And then it does, they don't have to do it our way. I mean, I have very strong opinions. If you listen to any of our podcasts, you'll hear about how I think you ought to invest in real estate, where I think we're wrong when people invest in real estate out of the way. It doesn't mean they have to do it our way. Uh, we can give a, a, a breadth of experience, not just of what we're doing, but with what the other thousand people did that we helped buy and sell real estate and invest in real estate you know, over the last 10 years. And so I think you know, there's a place where you can say, hey, let me tell you what I'm doing, may or may not be right for you. And then let me tell you what I'm actually seeing people do and how they're winning with real estate as an investment. And when you, when you have that, you're able to answer these in a very real and authentic way, um, rather than just the sales pitch that they get at 2 a.m. in the morning. Yep. And I feel like the sooner you can invest in real estate, the better. Like, just do it. Just invest. Start today. It's mm -hmm. such a game, you know, the timing, I, I think in some sense, uh, compounding interest, which kind of is what we're talking about, compounding equity, compounding interest. It's like the eighth wonder of the world. Right. Um, you know, my daughter, when she turned 18, she, she's got all upset with me. I had her open a, a Roth, uh, a Roth uh, IRA at 18 <laughs> years old. And we did the math and, and we figured out what the average income was. Um, in the community that she was planning to live in. And if she just contributed every paycheck uh, till she was 60, she got like $12 million. Right. And that was the average income, right? And, and I have I wish I started one at 18. Definitely. And, and nothing when you, you know, Shelby and I's approach is not just to own real estate. Um, when I was in my 20s, my aspiration was just to be on title. I just want to own real estate, own real estate. And you realize that's a pretty shallow, it's a pretty hollow goal. It, it all it means is you're responsible for the overflowing toilet and the, and the leaning fence. That's what that really means. And the property tax. What we're now all about is how do you own paid for real estate? Real estate that's free and clear. How do you go about this in such a way where you own the property um, and there's no mortgage payments on it? Because in my experience, 100% of the foreclosures occur with a home with a mortgage. So if we can eliminate the mortgage, and you may not start out that way. Okay? You don't start that way. We can finish that way. And if you did a 15-year mortgage uh, and you started at 20, 25, what life looks different for a real estate professional. You know, if they started at, at 25, life looks different at 40 with a paid-for home. I think the grass feels different. The grass isn't any different, but it's going to feel different between your toes when you own it free and clear. And there's less pressure. And there's less pressure. And in today's world with low interest rates, um, you know, Shelby, you and I own some investment properties that uh, they, won't eat, they don't take 15 years to pay off, right? They pay off quicker because of the cash flow that's generated from those. And I think that's important. Um, you don't have to wait 15 years to pay it off free and clear. 
And if we're going to create the financial plan for a real estate professional using those four R's, real estate, that's a big piece of that puzzle. And to the point where I think most financial advisors, in my experience, they don't put value in real estate because most people, they own it as their house, their primary residence. And we think that owning your primary residence is a good investment. Um, because it's gone up in value as well, and we, we tend to see people with equity or they pay their mortgage down and they have equity. But when they go out and they invest in real estate very intentionally as real estate agents, um, and they start filling that bucket, mm -hmm. it has a synergy, a multiplication effect. It affects everything else in their life as a result of owning real estate. And Rick, don't you have um, different homes slotted for your girls? <laughs> Whether it's maybe a wedding or college or if they want to live in it. Uh, so when my girls, I have three daughters, for those that don't know that are watching. Uh, I have three daughters. And when they were young, I wanted just to start to teach, starting to teach these things. What Shelby said is absolutely right. Like starting wow. earlier is the game changer. It changes. Like it's great for us, but it's amazing for our kids too. It's even better for our kids if they do it. It's not enough to know it. Knowing it is the first step, then they gotta do it. Yeah. And so I remember um, my kids were pretty young at this point. They were, but my kids are uh, each two years apart. So I think my oldest was probably about 15 years old. And um, I had printed off a picture of each of the of three properties at that time that I had owned. And I had writ, wrote their name on the top of it. So I have three daughters, April, Autumn, and Summer. And I divided up those properties to them. And Shelby alluded to it. And I said, okay, these are your properties to manage. And my oldest would have been maybe 14. So my middle was 12. My youngest was 10. And they were responsible for managing that property. Now, did dad help? A whole lot, right? <laughs> dad kind of walked them through a whole lot. But I will tell you what we had a tenant one time that didn't pay rent. And uh, I remember it was April, my oldest daughter's property. <laughs> and I learned very early on to be clear, you have a contract and a lease agreement for a reason, right? And don't deviate from that and hold to the terms of your lease agreement. Uh, otherwise, it's the wild, wild west out there, right? So you have a contract, use it. And we had to post on the door of this tenant's house a notice to pay rent or quit. And it was April's home. She might have been, again, 14, 15 years old, and she went with me. And we had to go to the property at that time, and we had to post that notice on the door. And then if, if to do it right, you got to post on the door. You got to take several pictures that you had made that posting and you had to mail it certified. Uh, tenant paid the rent and everything worked out fine. And, and that was a life lesson that she learned at a very early age about owning real estate and managing real estate and, and how to go about doing that and the responsibility associated with it. And Rick, I know we own the property together. Um, and there was one time when we took this property over, we had all of our kids there collectively um, doing work on that property. And why is that? Because we are real estate agents, we are real estate investors, and the more that our kids see the benefit of it and the hard work that it takes, the more that they get to actually um, harvest and reap from that. So we'll drive by that home sometimes and my kids will be like, I painted that room, I hope they're keeping it nice, and cool. we did that landscape. And so I think it's important that not only us as real estate investors, but teaching our kids to do that from an early age. Mm -hmm. There's something about um, hard work that it, it, I'm, I'm telling you, my kids are not allergic to hard work. <laughs> They're going to work hard. And there are life lessons that are learned. Um, it, could I have hired a painter to do a better job? Probably. You know, I, I can remember Shelby's son uh, cutting out. I used to do vinyl at the floor, uh, at the base of every cabinet. We'd buy a house. We'd cut out the vinyl. The idea was that the sink is inevitably going to leak. Mm -hmm. I would rather have a sheet of vinyl there that gathers the water. Um, and then we could just clean the sheet of vinyl rather than replacing the whole cabinet. So it was like a pattern. Every time I go into a home and I buy a property, I cut out a sheet of vinyl. And it's a square sheet of vinyl and you cut it. And, and he went through and he 
did that on this property, slid the sheet underneath each of the sinks. They weren't leaking, but in the event that they ever were to leak, it's not gonna damage the cabinet. I minimized that um, repair. And, um, and he went through and did that. I remember our daughters pulling the weeds out of the grass before we went through and did, did a gravel or a rock in front. Now, I remember our kids painting the land, uh, painting the, the exterior of the property. Uh, there are life lessons that are learned there. And if you're not careful, you know, there's, a, there's an old quote that says, you cannot be efficient with relationships. Right, like you can't you can't push a you, relationships take time. Relationships take um, experiences, right? And so you can't be a, always efficient in that model when you just want to get the job done. You bring your kids along so that you can show them and ex, they can experience this with you, because at the end of the day, really they're going to manage everything that you own, right? And if you don't teach them how to do it, this is where you have problems where people. And they acquire real estate or they require wealth or they require, and they got, they're clueless on what to do. Right. Yep. Mom did it, dad did it, you know, and, and they never learned these lessons. They never learned how to post a notice on a door. And if they didn't know how to post a notice on a door, then they went paralyzed when they had to do it for the first time. And you wonder why those that accumulate that wealth or they, they inherit those properties and you wonder why they go berserk. They go crazy the moment that they get it. They lose everything. You know, their parents or their grandparents may have spent a lifetime accumulating that. Kids lose it in a matter of a few years. And so teaching them at a young age how to do this, I think, is really imperative. And money doesn't just help one area of your life. It's not just like, okay, I got the financial category check, checked. No, it helps every area of your life. The number one cause of divorce is financial reasons, right? So we can get ahead of marital issues by then having financial issues, you know, minimized because we're teaching them how to do it. Yeah. And so I think that's really, really important. Um, I wasn't planning to go there, Shelby, but you reminded me of that story. And I've had my kids do that on a number of homes. And there's a benefit there to sweat equity. Absolutely. So Shelby, I have a question for you. Um, we have agents on the call. So I was wondering, you have tools as an agent that the average person doesn't have, like the MLS. So should you look at foreclosures or houses that have been on the market for a long time? Or you get clients and you talk with them and they're highly motivated. What tools can you use as an agent to benefit your investment property business? So I think you use all the tools out there that are available. You need to educate yourself as much as possible. And definitely the MLS is key and a huge tool that you could use as an agent because mm -hmm. you see these properties just as they're hitting the market. Even right. better is relationships with uh, different listing agents throughout your community, letting them know kind of what you're looking for. Uh, and if they have any investment properties or properties that may not um, be able to be financed due to the condition of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So relationship is key too. Uh, and then also sometimes we do run across clients who um, are in an emergency situation and need to you know, sell their home quickly. And so sometimes if we're ready and we're available, uh, then we can also use those as resources as well. As some of the clients who desperately need to sell now, and we know that if we purchase that property, it would go to a good home and we'll take good care of it. And a lot of times our clients really appreciate that. So those are just a few tools and resources that I think definitely we have at our disposal that uh, the average person wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And is this more of like a passive process where you kind of wait to see what comes across the board and you're ready whenever, or do you aggressively search for homes? What, what's your process? Either of you. Yeah. So, I mean, probably because the majority of my times, um, you know, we're serving other families in this capacity that it tends to be like when something does present itself, mm -hmm. uh, that we are ready and available to move on that. Okay. Uh, particular property so uh, but I do go out and search at times too uh, but I guess I'm not spending a certain amount of hours per week looking for that mm -hmm. I think Shelby's got a great point you know one of the things that we've realized is the opportunity of a lifetime must be captured within the lifetime of that opportunity mm -hmm. which means you need to be ready for that right like it's not you cannot um, and it starts with how you think 
It starts with your education. It starts by you learning. Uh, it starts by you experiencing these things. And if it, you show up in that window of time, that opportunity where you, you can, and you don't have that education, you don't have that experience, you don't have those resources, uh, or you're strapped financially you know, with debt everywhere and you don't have any available funds, mm -hmm. um, then you're not going to be in a place to capture that opportunity by somebody else. So I would tell you the baby step, start learning. Um, you know, Christina, you and I talk about, we do a, a podcast once a week on this topic. And so start learning. Last time I did a podcast on the 10 ways to take a baby step into buying your first investment home. I mean, 10 different ways. You say, well, I don't like option one through six. Fine, pick seven, eight, nine, or 10. Find one and start learning how to do it. Uh, I am convinced that if you had $5,000 to invest in real estate, the very best use of that $5,000 would be to invest in your education. And all that being said, we do these podcasts, they're free. Download them, learn, uh, educate yourself, meet with one of our team members, and they'll start peppering you properties that may be a good investment for you and begin to kind of lead and guide you in this direction. It can be a game changer. And I always like Rick that you say, the more you learn, the more you earn. Well, I, I think it's true. And that includes everything, investment, real estate, uh, your retirement, all of it. You've got to be a student of the market. And a lot of times, you know, one of the things <clears throat> Shelby and I decided to do very early on, and you probably captured it, <clears throat> pardon me, in the introduction, was that Shelby is a lead buyer coach. She's a buyer coach. Like that's the lane that we're in. It's not commercial. We don't do property management. You know, we're not out there uh, doing financing. Like we stay in that lane. And the reason we stay in that lane is there's a lot to learn and we wanna make sure that we provide our clients in that particular lane, of buying investment property, the kind of experience they're excited to tell a friend about. And you can't do that if you're trying to do a myriad of things and the average agents right now, agent is selling three to four houses a year. And what that means to me is if they're doing property management, commercial, industrial, business brokerage, finance, every time they sell a property, every time they do a loan, every time they represent a client on a commercial deal, they're learning along with their client. And how can they lead the way and provide a great experience when they're learning on their own? when they're learning themselves how to navigate this process. So we stay very, very focused on these areas so that we can provide our clients the kind of experience they're excited about. I think, you know, we got a nearly Shelby about a thousand five-star reviews right now. And I think that a part of that comes with that level of specificity, that level of really focused on providing our clients the kind of experience they're excited to tell a friend about by being specialists and not generalists. Absolutely. You probably wouldn't go to a general doctor for a toothache. You'd go to a dentist. A general doctor is a generalist. A dentist is a specialist. They're gonna give you a better experience and better resolve your problem by working with a specialist than you will a generalist. And so we as a team, our team have been very, very focused, well, for over 15 years now, of being specialists on the market so that we can have a pulse on the very best opportunities and how to capture them for our clients. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people think that they have to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars to educate themselves on buying and invest investment properties. And that's not necessarily the case. They really, sitting down and talking with somebody who is knowledgeable in those areas is the best education there is. So if it is a local real estate agent, if it's a family or a friend who's invested, who has investment properties in real estate, set time to meet with them for coffee. It'll be the best hour that you've spent on your education and didn't cost you much but your time. And likewise, if you're a real estate agent, you're watching this, like invest in real estate and you buy the product that you sell. Believe in it enough to own it yourself. Um, and when you do, there'll be a catalyst, not only in your financial life, but also in your business. You will be more productive in selling real estate as a result of being a business, of, of being a real estate owner of real estate, a real estate collector, rather than just a speculator. 
One thing that I'm always worried about is there's so many parts like yours. Well, I can hire your kids to paint and to weed, but if I needed a plumber or a, a property manager, how did you find trusted professionals to help you with the big stuff, electricians, all that? How do you find someone? I mean, I think as a real estate agent, you already have some of those relations solidified. And so people you know, that you're serving, families you're serving will ask you, hey, do you know of a carpet cleaner? Do you know of a painter? And so making sure that you have great relationships with those affiliate businesses is key. And then once you know you can trust them, then it's easy. Then you have a Rolodex of people that you can choose from to help you with your own projects on your investment properties. Mm -hmm. It's a great point and they're really imperative. You need to have those trusted sources. You know, when I rec we've got, I, I think, uh, several hundred people on our website, uh, a, a, uh, a page called Rick's Picks. And if you just Google my name and put Rick's Picks, you'll see the list of vendors that we recommend. And, uh, you know, usually I'll say, these are people that have come to my home. Like, okay. I trust them in my house. I trust them with my family. Now, you can get quotes from whoever you want, but the people that I'm recommending, I've been working in many cases with for over 10 years, and they visit my home, my investment property, they're amongst my family. Uh, I trust their quote. It may not be the always the lowest quote, uh, but it's a competitive quote, and, and they care deeply about our clients and agree to our philosophy, which is simply to provide our clients the kind of experience they're excited to tell a friend about. And when you refer a plumber or electrician or flooring company and they drop the ball, it's a reflection on you. And so it's imperative, it's, it's absolutely necessary that they're gonna take care of your clients like they're taking care of you and that they're gonna take care of the clients so they're an extension of your referral. Like, Every person that we ask for from Shelby does a great job. Shelby does a great job and all of her contacts collectively that provides our clients a better experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love that you started this group Agents Thrive because you don't have to go on this journey alone. We have Rick's picks, we have your experience. And so that's invaluable. I think if you're a new agent too, as you're building uh, your sphere of influence and growing your friends and family and contacts, you should be doing that on the business side as well. You should well, be doing it hand in hand, building both of those sides. Yeah, we actually call it a core 100. And the idea is that um, these are people that are out interacting with others. You think about a carpet cleaner. Sometimes the real estate agent is called first and then we recommend a carpet cleaner. And sometimes, the carpet cleaner is called, or painter, or landscaper, and they're called first, and then the real estate agent is called to sell the home. Yeah, we just landscaped, we just cleaned the carpets, or we just painted, or whatever. And so by you having these relationships, these trusted relationships, these reciprocal relationships, so they reciprocate opportunities back and forth, we'll be able to help you and grow your business, and you'll have a healthier business. Because what we know is the best form of business it, honestly, it comes in from referral. It shouldn't be your only form of business. But when somebody calls me and says, you've, you've helped my family, my friends, and they recommended that I talk to you, mm -hmm. that, that interaction, that exchange, um, that's just going to be a great experience. They know how I work. They know how Shelby works. They trust us. Uh, they know that their friends had a great experience. And that becomes... Um, the very best, the pinnacle of business. Not the only business. A lot of agents say, oh, I'm by referral only. That's a mistake. There are other people that need to be that need to be served as well in the community. But it's certainly an important part of your business. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. Uh, we're out of time and there's so many more things I wanna ask you. So uh, thank you so much, Shelby. You're gonna to have to come back and join us again because you are a wealth of knowledge. So thank oh, you, Rick and Julie. Well, thank awesome. you. And it's perfect because our next topic next week is how to find the right contractors to partner with. And our special guest will be Sergio Pontifus with SPC Painting Inc. And so he's going to tell us how to find reputable contractors and everything we need to know about that aspect. To learn more about Rick and his team or to ask any questions, please go to agentsthrive.com. And be sure to join our Facebook group, Agents Thrive, and subscribe to our podcast, Rick Fuller Podcast. Thank you for spending part of your day with us, and we're excited to have you join us next week. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.